where the Cisco Meraki technology stops, Data3 starts. So if, you, if you're looking to understand how the technology applies to your business, how to identify the right Meraki technology for you, how to design it, or if you want a partner who can just um, take the responsibility in managing it end to end and really take that, take that challenge away from you, that's the conversation that we want to have with you. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass across to Scott Williamson. Scott has been um, Scott is a Cisco uh, engineer here in, in Brisbane, a long-standing member of the, uh, of the Cisco team, um, and it's my pleasure to welcome him to talk to you about Meraki. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. No worries. So a bit about myself, in case you don't know who I am. Most of you, some of you do, some don't. So um, I've been in the Meraki side of the Cisco business as a Meraki specialist for about the last um, 18, 20 months. Before that, I was a Cisco traditional SE covering all technologies. Um, you know, in different levels of complexity. Before that, I used to work in the customer land in um, Powerlink and Energex um, and Spark, if you want to use that name as well, inside there, looking after quite complex background systems and, you know, power systems control. So my journey over life has got simpler in the technology I use, but selling simplicity or talking about simplicity is actually, you've got to know a lot of complexity and what it does underneath the covers. The power of a radio button in Meraki, um, is quite powerful. Understanding what that radio button does is, is probably the key to knowing what, you know, of using that technology. Today we're going to cover two topics. Um, uh, the hottest topic around, according to everyone, is SD-WAN. I'll demystify that a bit and put my spin on what that is, because it is a marketing term. Um, we'll make that nice and simple. And then also Meraki Vision, which is about um, having video surveillance cameras or, or cameras and using the smart cameras and making that simple to deliver business outcomes. From using, for never looking at the video, actually, is, is, the, is the ultimate goal inside that. So the agenda here is first just to cover SD-WAN, why the hype, what's it all about, what's all this rubbish doing, and why is it important, the industry trends uh, analysis on that. Second half is, you know, Meraki SD-WAN, why Meraki and Cisco are the leader in this space and, and the amount of deployments and what we're doing throughout the world and how we make that easy for customers to deploy and simple. And then the, the MX as well, which is our SD-WAN um, UTM appliance, and, and talking about the security sides of that, how that makes it simple to go direct to net, which is part of what SD-WAN is from our vision and our, our point of view. Security in one box, making it simple for an organisation. A bit of a chat then about the uh, MV security cameras, um, the smart cameras, I think they're called now, and the future of what, what we're doing around that sort of side to disrupt that industry as well, which is what Meraki's all about, disrupting. We disrupt our big parent Cisco as much as we do the industry. Q&A, but I'm happy to do Q&A as, as we go through. If you think I'm, I'm not speaking the truth, call it out and we'll um, have that discussion. It's always fun, much much more interactive than me just standing here talking with my monotone Australian voice. We'll go from there. So about Meraki. So Meraki, as you know, was acquired by Cisco probably about six years ago now, I think. Um, it's the fastest growing portfolio in Cisco and massive, massive growth inside there. And that's all about simplicity and what we do. Is Meraki the product for every company and every part of every organisation? No, it's not. It's all about that 80, 90% um, where we need that simplicity to make it easier. You know, what I think people call it commoditising technology, except for Meraki isn't a commodity because everyone's trying to copy it. Um, so Meraki's mission statement is the key, key to what we live for and what I wake up to every morning. It's the background on my desktop. It's, it's where I always bring it back with customer conversations. So Meraki technology is all about simplifying powerful technology, as I said, making that radio button do a powerful function, that drop-down box, that tick box, what we need to do, what, what it does in there. So simplify that. And doing that is, is actually quite hard. Um, the amount of effort that we go through into in the back end, the code that gets written to deliver that capability, and then turning that into a GUI on the dashboard, takes a lot longer than what I'd hope half the time. But making that simple and getting it usable for customers is the hard bit. So Meraki takes that powerful technology, makes it simple. The bit, next bit on that is to free passionate people to um, focus on their mission. So that's the, the engineers, the technical people in the room you know, that, that are passionate about making the best environment for their users ever. Um, it's about freeing them up from that day-to-day -day operations, that day-to-day -day activity to um, reach out to those groups previously left in darkness. So they're the groups inside all our organisations that are doing skunk work, shadow IT, buying bits of Amazon, uh, AWS, you know, doing other bits and pieces, buying some other third-party software to run on their devices, buying their own iPhones and putting apps on them. Those groups, they actually need IT to help them. They need that, that side of the business to do that in, in a business scale. And IT know how to do that. The business typically doesn't. So they're the groups that, that by simplifying the powerful technology, let you get away from the day-to-day -day mundane, boring tasks, maybe pass them you know, to, to someone of a, of a lighter skill. 
and then reach out to those groups and go and you know, extract their business requirements and deliver to that is, is where it's all about. So that's what Mark is. Technology that simply works. Um, it's probably the, the understated bit inside there. So we all understand you know, doing firmware updates, patching, all that kind of stuff. Meraki makes that really simple. And the way we'd even do our firmware updates and pushing those beta out, the beta software out, and those sort of capabilities, the analytics we'd use in the back end to make sure our software quality and hardware quality is king, it is quite, you know, it is quite difficult to do. The good thing about Meraki is because we can see every single device on there, we use that analytics for, for good to understand what the network's functioning like. We do things like proactive reach out. So one of my customers that moved to Meraki late last, year, um, they, they got a proactive email from us saying, hey, you've got this feature configured and that configured. You know, if you read this manual here, they actually don't work too well together for this reason. You probably want to either, you know, turn this one off or, or modify that one to suit your environment. They're like, oh, wow, well, I've never had this before in my life. And that's because of the way the back end, the back end works and sees inside there. You know, we also optimise that so that they can't be turned on better together and that kind of stuff. But in that case, they were two things that, you know, that, that would be enabled in there. So how many people running Meraki in production environment in the room here today? A couple. How many people are playing with it? How many people have never heard of it? How many people think it's a toy? There's got to be one. There's always one. I did that in Cisco Live. and so How many people think it's a toy? One guy put his hands up. Always happens. Um, inside there. So, you know, what does... So Meraki is a cloud-managed dashboard. So really, Meraki product isn't the switches, isn't the routers. They're just the boxes on premise that do that capability. They're the, they're the bits that just, just pump along and do it. The dashboard is what Meraki is all about. That's the bit about simplicity. That's the bit that does the turnkey installations, the zero touch deployments, you know, the update features. It, it's, it's the bit that scales to manage whether it's one site or 1,000 sites or 10,000 sites or 20,000 sites. If you go above 25,000 devices on Meraki dashboard, come and see me. We've got to redesign the way our cloud works to suit you. Um, I wish all my customers had more than 25,000 Meraki devices. It'd be a good problem to have. Which in turn, making all that simple, that, that simple config, being able to template a site and, and push that out to a thousand sites to be the same config, all those things in turn with firmware updates, patches, the simplicity inside that patching is what reduces the operational cost of the network and makes it simple to run. That's what Meraki is all about. It's a dashboard, 100%. Um, size and scale of Meraki um, inside there as well. So currently we're sitting, these are our published numbers, always changed. 390,000, 400,000 unique customers inside the Meraki in, environment. There's over 5 million devices online. I think we hit two million, bit over 2 million unique networks out there the other day. It was all over LinkedIn and everything, Facebook and all that. And API calls per day, 30 million plus calls per day. Now, API calls, um, that's the customer calls, not our back end calls. So Meraki wasn't going to do API in their dashboard quite a few years ago. And they thought, oh, we'll just stick it in there to give customers something to poll against, give them that data, some of that raw data in the back end so they can build their own solutions around our dashboard. That's now grown from being like quite a small number of calls to 30 million plus calls a day. We're re-optimising our whole back end for API, um, making it simple, a lot more learning activities so customers can use it and partners as well. So some partners build, you know, you have the Meraki dashboard and that management, and it's, it's just one part of your whole infrastructure. And then you have other parts of the infrastructure you want to try and make as Meraki-fied as possible. Some partners out there build their own dashboards to allow customers to manage an environment that simply where to Meraki they just do an API call and to something else they'll do CLI and something else they'll go via some other SD controller to do that and make that simple. And that's what the API is there for. Like I said, before the, you know, the 80, 90, so it's about 90% of the solution should be delivered in the dashboard and 10% used for API. The interesting thing about API is we're moving to the next generation of open API standards which is a great thing for developers as well to, to you know, build their own features around that, where we'll get to a point that as we're beta testing, remember before I said when we create the GUI, that's the longest part of our development process for a new feature in the Meraki dashboard is developing the GUI, making it simple, is that we'll be able to move to a point that when we do you know, beta capability in the back end, because there's no CLI from Meraki, use the API to configure that to test it, and then we can start to push that out to partners and customers quicker for them to test the technical back end before we go and write the simple GUI for that inside there. And there'll also be other tweaks and modifications in the API that, that, you know, that customers will be able to do to make that simple. Or you don't have to do it at all. It should be on the dashboard, like that, that 90%. So don't be scared about APIs, it's not hard. My version of APIs, you go into Postman, you do a poll, you find that bit, you copy that script, you put it in there, you Google the internet, find the rest of that code, paste it all together, keep moving the brackets around, and then your code works. That's, that's development from my point of view. Or you get your um, 14, 15-year-old daughter to optimise it so it works. 
is how it works. So Meraki scale and size as well, as I said, 375,000 customers inside here, one point, oh, it's two million networks, we'll forget about that, this is old. Um, 290,000, 300,000 customers running Meraki wireless that got a capability we call wireless health inside there. So wireless health is the ability to um, quickly see how your network's working from a, a health point of view. We also, um, MXs, which is the uh, SD-WAN UTM appliance, um, there's over 650,000 of those online. And out of that 650,000, there's about 15,500 customers that have that configured in an SD-WAN configuration. That's with two uplinks, with doing application steering, and most likely doing direct to net for that sort of traffic. So that's the largest SD-WAN vendor in the world with Meraki stats alone, not including the Viptela Cisco stats. Disrupt or be disrupted. So because of Meraki time to market, the ease of pushing that out, you know, organisations that are, you know, what's the latest law firm doing to do, you know, big data analytics and AI to, you know, find out where people are in help, need help and so they can, you know, help them through the court process to make the most money for that person and that organisation. That's, that's the disrupt or be disrupted. So Meraki helps you forget about running your day-to-day your -day business as much so that your, your time to market's quicker. So there's no lost opportunity inside that. You can start to make revenue much quicker. If you want to roll out, um, for example, um, one of the, uh, I can't reference all customers today because it's been recorded. Um, one of the uh, large banking organisations that also do insurance is that when there's a, a natural disaster before for them to roll out um, you know, field-based insurance assessors, used to take weeks and weeks and weeks. A few of those, in, in, even in this state, have moved to Meraki to you know, pop up little sites to be able to get them out there, get that field assessors in the field to assess stuff, come back in, upload their gig and gig of files using things like SD-WAN to bring that capability back, back in. If it took them four weeks to go and start doing that assessing, you know, you know, they've got to get their quotes out, they've got to get you know, um, builders in to repair stuff, those sort of things, they can, they can start that process quicker. They can start booking people in quicker. Their time to market's quicker. Their quicker resolution time. Therefore, you know, the, the lost opportunity isn't there for them. Back to the um, capability, so dashboard, as I said, 90% of the capability should be delivered in the dashboard and then the APIs for the rest of it. So we have open APIs, we don't charge for them. Meraki is a simple licensing policy, one device, one license, that gives you all capability. We don't go and charge extra for the API, extra for the analytics, all those sort of capabilities. So that's the bits over here where you can just use this tool as, a, as an enterprise tool, but if you're in a retail market and you want to start using that data to understand what your customer's doing in your store, that's where we give you the API. SD-WAN rocket ship. So what's happening with SD-WAN and why do we need SD-WAN? So you know, everyone's locked into carriage contracts, they cost quite a bit. You know, there's consumer grade internet out there which has got reasonable SLAs. I stick in a consumer grade internet service and maybe a 4G service, I'm going to get pretty good coverage. Maybe two different carriers, one MBN, one one of the carriers that don't use the MBN backhaul, you know, that, that'll cost me a couple hundred bucks a month as opposed to $800 a month for a 4 meg MPLS link. Yes, that 4 meg MPLS link has nice SLAs around it where I get the, the dollars back where, per month when it didn't work. Um, I never get back the lost business value inside there. But it is, you know, expensive and complex and I'm stuck to that. I'm stuck to that routing into that network. I'm stuck with, you know, managing all that through there. So the bits on SD-WAN and why that is the number of SaaS applications that the companies are deploying, like we looked at, you know, uh, at the side of um, Meraki and Cisco, you know, Office 365, Salesforce, um, our dashboard, you know, the, the number goes on and on for the number of fat SaaS applications we use. Why do I bring all those applications back into my corporate head office to send out via my web content scanners out through my firewalls that are already loaded, you know, out to the internet? I've got to keep fattening those internet pipes to send that, that out there, and I've got to keep fattening all that other harbour inside there. So why don't we just go, well, look, we've actually got a contract around that SaaS provider that provides this level of security. We may use some other method to make sure that they're securely looking after our data in the back end, like CloudLock or something like that. Um, wh why don't I just send that data straight to them? You know, wh what's it going to do? It's over HTTPS, it's encrypted, it meets all the requirements and everything. If it was a credit card transaction, everyone's happy with that. You know, so, so let's just get that data out of our site straight to the internet. Let's not worry about bringing it back into our head office and sending it out. That's what um, you know, the, the, the push on the SaaS applications there is for. Business traffic, so the amount of business traffic running over the, um, you know, the internet is, is quite low and as we move down the SD-WAN path, the predictions is that most will be over SD-WAN. So SD-WAN is really just a secure overlay over any underlying technology. So whether it's internet, MPLS, 4G, frame relay, if we saw that ATM, you know, layer two links from the carriers as they're pushing at the moment. 
I, I don't care what that technology is, I just tunnel over. I just build a to point to point link straight over top of that. And then if I don't, if I want to send it straight to the internet and there's internet link there, I just send that peel that straight out to there. That traffic I'm sending over those paths, then I can choose which way it goes and, and what it does to business SLAs. So the characteristics of an SD-WAN environment is really must support multiple connection types. Um, who really cares, as I said, as long as it's presented as Ethernet, we're happy, uh, or 4G, or LTE, or 5G, or whatever it's going to be next week. Must support um, VPNs for that, that's our secure overlay, so that's simple. Um, must provide a simple interface for managing the WAN, there's nothing simpler than Meraki for managing SD-WAN, I'll show that in a second. And can do dynamic path selection, I can pick out that voice application and say it'll always go over my MPLS path, over that tunnel, and only fall to my other internet path in the event that that falls out of SLA, that kind of side of it. And that's, that's actually Gartner's four characteristics of SD-WAN. There should be a fifth one in there which is about sending that internet traffic straight to the internet. So as I was talking before, the issue we have now is we, we've got this, you know, $600 a month, just a liberal number, it's not factual, you know, for this MPLS link. Um, it's four meg out to site, you know, I've got to change that, that's running over copper. I want to go up to eight megs. Oh, okay, you've got to get a fiber connection in or aggregate, you know, dual four meg links. That's going to cost cost money. So it's going to cost me twelve hundred bucks a month or something to increase that to what I want to do. So the struggle is there. The price to increase that is 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 quite high. So what other options have we got out there? So we could get a router. We could plug in other links and we could start to send traffic down those links ourselves. Write lots of config and and lines and and do some application steering. And we could send that over MPLS and then we could go to MPLS and broadband to send that out there, but we're just going to send internet stuff to the broadband and internal stuff down the MPLS path. Or then we you know, might go, well, everything's SaaS, anyway. we just go broadband, broadband. But I still don't have end-to-end -end control and I haven't got, uh, you know, I'm not carrier agnostic, I'm not doing that overlay to make that simple. And then in, in the costing side of that, if we, were, if we were moving from something like the $600 MPLS service down to dual broadband, you know, uh, Realistically, it's you know probably you know 90 bucks a month for one service, maybe for both 180 a month or something like that to move to that to, to give realistic figures. And depends on whether it's business grade or consumer grade internet and, and what what's best for your business, which is part of that working out what's going on there. Here's a real case we did for a customer recently, which which part of this case moves to internet as as your carriage or to a lower cost carriage. This mightn't be internet, might be. Um, some carriers offer internet services that are you know, business grade, as long as they're all on my network, they'll offer a higher level of SLA around that, which is what we're trying to get for that underlay. Or we might go, hey, it's two different, completely different carriers, we should be fine with inside that. So this customer here, WAN cost savings were, you know, was pretty much half um, based on that deployment. This can be done really quickly with SD-WAN because we take our existing link, we get rid of all that BGP routing and all that complexity, we just tunnel over that existing carriage, the MPLS or, or the likes, and then we put in our internet link and we just create the tunnel over there. We can then remove that link, add another one, and then we create another tunnel and it's that easy. It's just, you know, ticks in the box, moving cables around to do that. I might, might have oversimplified that a bit, but, you know, that's my, I'm allowed to do that. No one's going to pull me up. Um, so just to um, remove any confusion from the room around um, the Cisco portfolio, so Cisco um, has two SD-WAN offerings in market. There's the Meraki SD-WAN, which is all about simple, you know, lean, light IT, easy to manage, doesn't do all the complexity. So if you're talking about things like multi-VRF, that's going to be our Viptela side of the family. Um, if, you're going to, if you want to do, you know, single VRF but do segmentation, then that, that, the Meraki side can do that as well. And we've got to be careful with that too. I'll see a lot of FUD put in the market around Meraki not doing um, multi-VRF or segmentation. It's a lot of rubbish. Meraki does segmentation really well. We do it for, for um, banking institutes and retailers and we do it to PCI compliance. Um, what we don't do is multi-VRF um, because not, it's 10% not it's, it's of, the, of the world probably needs that. And if that's the case, that's this side of the fence over here. The reason why I say that is a lot of the time when we see multi-VRF deployed in a customer environment is they say, oh, we're going to do guests on one VRF and do corporate on the other VRF. And we're going to have contractors on another VRF. We want the contractors to print to the corporate printer. So that means that every side all of a sudden I'm doing a route leak and I'm doing firewall rules. And they say, oh, but... The guest has got the internet service on that. I want everyone to be able to get to that internet service locally. So then I'll start doing some route links and those other two VRFs and doing some firewall rules to allow that through. You end up with this, this hodgepodge, you know, mess of, of, you know, very hard to secure 
environment. That's, that's pretty typical and so that's much like when I go out and talk to customers about quality of service out there as well, is that everyone's got these wonderful 22Q quas policies until you ask them to send you the CLI output from their router and you realise they haven't bound it to the interface and it's very common. Oh, we took that off three years ago because something wasn't working, you know. So digging into that and making that simple is, is what, I, what I do for a living. Um, so SD-WAN, so we'll just go straight in the boxes now. Um, this is uh, the, the Meraki portfolio for UTM or SD-WAN appliances. Basically the greatest thing about these compared to a lot of other vendors products is that every box runs the same version of code, all has the same features, functionality, same bugs, um, and, and same thing. So if, if you have a Meraki network and you're running you know, little baby MX64 and, and you get to 200 megabits per second, you go, oh geez, that little box isn't coping too well, I might move up to the MX100. You delete that, cap that guy off your network, add that guy to the network, move the cables over, it receives all the same config because you never configure a device in Meraki. You configure the capability in the dashboard in the network it's, and then that inherently pushes it down to the device which makes it easy. Um, so yeah, all the boxes, bigger, better, faster, more um, and then, then our virtual box for AWS and the Dua. Um, and that's all I can talk about. That. So Meraki's built SD-WAN on a capability that was released in the MXs when they first released, which is called Auto VPN. So setting up an IPsec site-to-site -site VPN, I don't know if you've ever set one up, um, can be quite long and hard, certificates, all that kind of, so it, you know, make sure everything talks correctly, and then all of a sudden she comes up, and then you can start routing down there. I want to do a second one, you know, adds complexity. You want to do multi-vendor, it makes it hard. So Meraki turned, um, you know, turned Auto VPN to give the same security and control, but as simple as uh, clicking on a radio button in the dashboard to be able to build that, that VPN capability. In the back end, we look after all the other certificates, we look after the authentication and make that simple for the customer. So we de-risk that for the customer. If we want to nail up multiples of those, then we just nail them up, it's that, that simple inside there. Um, we then provide all this monitoring capability, which I'll show in the dashboard inside there, rather than look at this one here, static slides are boring. Um, where, we, where we monitor all our links for latency, jitter, um, loss, and we make up, and we you know, make the MOZ score from that with a calculation. And MOZ score is a mean, op, 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 mean opinion score, which is around voice, voice grade. Is it voice grade? Is it, you know, 3.6 or above or, or whatever your voice vendor wants it to be? Ready for voice, because that's what we care about. That's going to be the, probably the hardest app to run over any network is voice. So let's just monitor for that, and then we just tie all our metrics to, through that capability. So every single link, the auto VPN that gets nailed up by Meraki, we monitor, we monitor for all that kind of stuff. Extensions to public cloud, so that's the virtual MXs that we would you know, be able to put out there. So you say you've got a customer there, it's got my, everything in my data center, I put an MX there, MX at sites, so I can do that, that SD-WAN overlay. Oh, we're actually gonna start moving this off to AWS or Azure. So that's just a virtual MX inside that, that capability. I still went up the other week because uh, I felt like I, I should know exactly what it's like. Um, it was easy as going on, you know, creating an AWS account, applying my credit card, deploying the Meraki appliance, adding the license to it, and it was done. And then click on um, uh, Hub as an auto VPN hub, and it was all configured. It was, it was super simple to get that traffic in there and out there. Then I can start to transition workloads to the cloud, but my connectivity, my SD-WAN overlay is done really simply. Um, th then underneath the covers is where they get a little bit more complex, and I hope I'm not going too far into the weeds with this, is where we start to write application policies on the Meraki dashboard. Now, it's probably going to be harder to explain in the slide than what, I, what, what it is to show you in the dashboard, but we basically do you know, dual active VPNs. We can load balance, load share across those. It's per session load balancing, which is key. If you look at some of the other vendors out there, they do per packet load balancing, which is great, sounds good in a marketing term. As a network guy, that's a really crap idea because that means it's going to go up this path and maybe come back that path. Asymmetric routing, not real good for my environment. Different you know, performances on those paths. Policy-based routing, so underneath the covers we do policy-based routing where we can steer an application, not IP addressing, not, you know, we can match an application based on you know, a, a, you know, application matching signatures or based on a URL or based on something that you want to do. And we can steer that down a certain path to get that, that coverage and push across there and file to the other path based on certain metrics. Dynamic path selection, you can just say, look, here's my app, just use the path that's the best for that app. You know, voice, just let it, let whatever path you want it to you, whatever you think is right, just send it down there is all we can do inside there as well is the, is the third option in that. I'll show you that in the, in the real world. To, to make it easy to understand what your SD-WAN network is doing, 
Meraki introduced about, I don't know, less than a year ago, a, a product called uh, Meraki Insight, which is all about application experience monitoring or user experience monitoring for applications over that SD-WAN, even straight to internet to monitor SaaS applications. So as we've moved to SaaS applications from our internal servers is that when it was the internal server, I could go over and talk to the server guy and say, hey, everyone's complaining about your application. I think you've got something going on. He can go and log in and go, ah, oh, it's not my problem, it's always the network. And the network guy goes and does some captures and then tells the server guy that, you know, here's the captures I did and it took one second to come in and out of your server. It's still a, net, still a server fault, it's never a network fault. Um, so we tried to make that easy. As you move to SaaS application, it's harder to get. You, know, you can't just phone up you know, uh, Salesforce and say, hey, you know, your, your application isn't running too well. They go, yeah, it's your local internet link. You know, um, off you go. At least with, um, so with Meraki Insights, the ability to you know, look at those transactions as they're going through our MX appliances and, and create a simple dashboard to say, how's my application running? Is it good, bad, um, or, or, or not working? Um, and where is that problem? Is it on the LAN side of my appliance? Is it on the WAN side? Or is it actually a server response time issue? We just use normal metrics underneath the cover today. So you can sit there with a packet capture, go through this and work it out yourself. We just pop it in there for you to make it easy. I will stress it's only web-based applications today inside there. Um, which then allows you to understand what your SaaS applications are doing. So one of my customers um, last year in WA did a, did a beater on this. They had a site, they'd rolled it off as 365 to all their sites. Um, they had one site where was a group of users that were the only users complaining about you know, the performance of the application. They just wrote that user group off as the group that always complained about every application, everything inside the company, and it's like bad luck. Um, we stuck um, Meraki Insight on to all their sites so they might have a visibility inside what's going on, just as a test, to, obviously, it's to you know, sell the product. Um, straight away, they worked out that these, these group of users we're getting hairpinned to a certain server inside the server farm for the Office 365, which had a performance score of 37 out of 100. So 37 is not real good, 100 is really good, uh, one's really bad. So they were able to log a meaningful request then to the, to the SaaS provider to say, which was Microsoft via the methods, to say, you know, oh, we're seeing problems with this sort of thing. And they're like going, oh, yeah, yeah, that's cool. And then they move that server out of their load balancing pool for that, their application. And straight away, those users had a different experience. They, they stopped complaining so much about that application, which is actually a really good thing. It would have just been written off from IT. It was too hard to go and diagnose, look at that. Like you're using Office 365. It's always slow. Who cares? They were able to quickly go and, go and have a look in there and see what's going on, what applications they're running and the users. Again, we'll have a quick look at that in a second. As I, as I said, any questions about that? Or As I said, um, Part of the SD-WAN approach is to have those tunnels for my private connections to send starter back, but then send stuff straight to the internet. Now, most companies won't just transition straight to that. It's got to be a bit of a journey, and some always say no. Even the ones that have said no to me in the last 18 months have then gone on to, to give it a go because, you know, we can't keep scaling our back ends out. You know, we might use something else rather than scaling our back ends out, um, you know, from a Cisco point of view like Umbrella to scale out the cloud scale of that security, or we might just use the capability MX. So with the MX, there's two licenses for the MX. It's one or the other, it's not both. Um, we do see some orders come through for both, which is good, but you don't need both. Enterprise license, which gives you all the capability of our MX appliances. And then we have advanced security, which gives you the subscriptions for security above that. So it turns on things like advanced malware protection, IPS, IDS with signatures, content filtering, um, and there's a fourth one that's escaped my head, uh, GA firewall rules. Um, is what get turned on as part of that. And that's just these subscriptions. You don't have to go off and have a subscription for advanced malware protection. You don't have to have a subscription for, you know, signatures um, for IPS, IDS from Cisco or anything. You just buy advanced security license, one, three, five, seven or ten years, and that gives you all the subscriptions for that. Turn it on, turn it off, it's a radio button, a drop-down box um, inside there. So that's security made simple. The approach in here, which is probably the slide I should have had up, is all this capability. So regardless of the SD-WAN, from Cisco, the capability is the same inside there. So you don't need to do security on the box, you don't need any other, uh, any other product sets. So yeah, enterprise firewall, IPS, IDS, URL filtering, and, and, and we have a cloud connector for Umbrella inside there. Um, so this is all the capability I was saying that, that the advanced security license gives me, um, which is next generation firewall, IPS, URL content filtering, um, geo firewall rules, oh, malware protection with AMP, um, do all the updates in the back end. We've actually just changed in the recent version of code our um, IPS engine so that we can do inline updates really easy without having to restart that module and put it in the forwarding mode where it goes through, ticking the box and more security guys. 
and PCI compliance across the whole thing, which you get with or without that, depending on how you're going to send that traffic. Send it to the internet, you need event security. The back end of all of that is, is connections. It's actually APIs off to the rest of the Cisco world, except for you don't have to see them, you don't have to configure anything, it makes it nice and easy. But we use a Telos cloud, which is the biggest security cloud in the world for monitoring what's going on inside. The amount of emails and like it sees 60 billion email messages a day, you know, that's not from my kids because they don't send emails anymore. It's the old-fashioned way of communicating. You know, how many malware samples a day, how many web capabilities. So this cloud collects all this data. It's what we use in the back end of Cisco for advanced malware protection, AMP, the IPS, the snort engines, all that capability, you know, web content filtering, email content filtering. This is the back end engine for all that. It's the biggest by far. So with the MX, with advanced security enabled, it just takes a lot of these issues you know, out, of, out of your hands. It makes it much easier to deploy. A, a good example of uh, the way that we do the automatic updates in the back end, which can be controlled by the client as well, is when, we, when the crack vulnerability for wireless came out, I'll talk about wireless, um, is that it's released to all the vendors about two to three weeks before like a black hat event or something like that, where they come out and say, we're going to go on stage on this day and we're going to talk about this vulnerability we found in WPA2, in wireless connection security mechanisms. Um, you know, you, you've got till, till three weeks' time until we go on stage in Vegas and announce about this vulnerability on how great we've done. We found this, you know, capability that, that, that can be, you know, um, used in all wireless networks throughout the world to, to break um, authentication. So what Meraki did in the back end, you know, a week goes on, the patch is written, um, we pushed out an out of, out of turn firmware update to our devices, the customers could either go on. That's the second one we've had inside three months. That's weird. Meraki's pushing out more updates than we need. Um, yeah, we'll just, we'll just update our APs to the latest stable code. It's all sweet. Others that didn't, they went, oh, we'll schedule that for next month in our change window. You know, they, they, did, they did that. And we allow that capability. The ones that, um, then, when, then they went on stage, that, you know, on, it was actually on the Monday morning, which was, no, it was on Tuesday, actually. So on Monday, I was in the office, you're getting calls from a few customers because the leakage came out. Hey, there's a major issue with the wireless in the world. Everyone can get onto encrypted networks and, and you know, get all my, all my data. You can either do two things, firmware update or turn off um, 802.11r fast roaming. Um, that was the guidance we gave people. Easy, simple, really from a customer's point of view, there was nothing to do and they were protected. And that's the same with all the other vulnerabilities that happen in the back end around the MX security as well, is the way that we patch and do that stuff in, in the background makes it easy for a customer to almost set and forget. Obviously, you still be aware about them because someone in your company will read the latest CIO magazine and have to come down and say, hey, have you fixed this problem yet? Yep, yep, here's the release from Cisco. It was actually patched in this version. We pushed that out last week. We're done inside there. Advanced malware protection on the um, MX as well. So that's, that's done. I thought that was the next slide. That's one after that. Um, so that's, that's just to keep you on there. Radio button, switch it on. Looks at the, does the inspection of files. So the way the AMP works, it does a hash of the file, sends it up to a cloud service, works out you know, whether that's um, a good hash or a bad hash for that file, allows it through or blocks it depending on what you want to do. We make it nice and easy inside that to deploy in, in there. And then um, if you want to go further than that, so AMP might say, hey, that file is not known good or not known bad, it's actually unknown. Then with, this is not included in the event security license, there's the um, threat grid capability inside Cisco, which is sandboxing in the cloud. So we have direct integration for that. It's easy to configure. It's um, um, like one key and a drop-down box and then two more drop-down boxes. So it's four clicks um, to turn that on. That'll then say, hey, this unknown file, send it up to the um, threat grid cloud to do that inspection in the cloud. And then, then that builds that database up whether it's known good or known bad and pushes that through. So that's um, above and beyond for the extra, extra security. Um, this is the capability how it works as the internet File comes through the MX, it, it sends up the hash to the AMP cloud. Are you allowed in? Yes, no. Uh, it's, um, it's yes, off it goes. It's no, block it. If it's unknown and I don't have an, uh, a threat grid subscription, then you can choose. If you do, sandbox in the cloud. Cloud will then update you to say, okay, that's a known good file, for example. It'll also update the AMP database as well, and we're all good from there. That's the way it works under the, other, under the covers. So the integration here off to all the um, Cisco security products used inside the MX, and like I said, one license for doing all this is all here. It's all under, under the covers. There's nothing for you to really configure apart from drop-down boxes and radio buttons. So licensing from Meraki point of view um, is super complex. There's one device, one license, and then you pick your number of years. There's going to be a big change to our licensing later on this year. We'll move to per device licensing, which will add a lot more flexibility um, inside there, but it'll still remain this sort of approach where it's just 
one device, one license, all capability, nothing more complex than that. It's more around the way we do a thing called co-termination and those sort of things. A few customers in here that use Meraki will be quite happy about that change. Others that work on that be, won't care. Um, the current portfolio from Meraki, as I said, dashboards are product and we have access points. Uh, MX is our SD-WAN security UTM appliance. Meraki Insights, that, um, that uh, you know, application visibility monitoring inside there. Um, switching um, from you know simple layer two switches, I was going to say dumb. Simple layer two switches up to you know the latest M gig port, M gig switches with you know heaps of M gigs. M gigs using existing copper cabling to do up to 10 gigabits per second, or two and a half and five gigabits per second to handle the next generation of wireless, which is 802.11ax or Wi-Fi 6 inside there. So we have the whole range inside there, including aggregation switches, a 40 gig aggregator and a 10 and a one gig aggregator switch. Systems Manager is our um, mobile device manager or enterprise mobility manager. Um, super simple for that. Cloud managed for managing your, your mobile fleet. And MV, our security cameras, which is what we'll have a look at um, now. Is there any questions on SD-WAN still or keep going? You happy? Everyone's still awake, it's good. So what are smart cameras? So <laughs> from a um, CCTV point of view, Meraki went, we think this is quite a good market. There's a lot of old stuff out there. We should enter this market and create a, a security camera for security surveillance. Um, however, what are the problems with the current s systems out there and how can we disrupt this market? Let's make a cloud-based, cloud-managed network um, that addresses all the uh, cloud-managed camera, addresses all the current complaints about customers. So what the current complaints that we get, we went out and surveyed with our customers was, I have these cameras and no one really cares um, what they are, they're hyper different vendors, I'll pick a camera based on my use case. That's cool. I want to record that vision. I've then got to um, have a network video recorder in my network, this little guy here, um, which is separate, maybe even from a different vendor that has disks in it, has to be managed, runs an operating system, typically doesn't run any virus, um, you know, it's hard to manage, probably running some older version of Windows XP or something like that, or some Linux system that no one knows to log on for. So that's your NVR typically, um, and that's the same everywhere. And then, then there's going to be the, the monitoring workstation inside there again, you know, Windows 95, Windows XP, you know, something unpatched, some Linux system again, you know, oh, we'll just put that on a separate network because it's all insecure. It's also probably one of the biggest points of hacker um, uh, insertion points into networks is, is these sort of networks because they're the forgotten about network over there that's running, you know, every NVR, you know, could potentially be a, a Windows machine or a Linux machine with a fair bit of grunt. It's a good good insertion point in my network. It's going to be plugged into my other network so we can get that video across to over there. It's a good place to get into a network from that point of view. So we're trying to address all of those. You know, how do I patch it? How do I keep that up to date? How do I keep my video um, running? How do I how do I use this for business purposes? So what Meraki did was went, well, let's go and put all this in the camera, the whole lot, straight in the camera, and use a web browser to monitor it. How are we going to approach this and, and do that? So that's that's exactly what we did. Put a industrial grade SSD in the camera. Um, put a little grunty um, CPU and, and GPU, graphical processing unit, in each camera, um, and then just manage it from the cloud, all visibility in the cloud. There's no on-prem storage required. It's all stored inside there. Um, it, remote access to videos easily, so if you're watching, if you're on the local premise, and I've got a web browser up for the Meraki dashboard, I can look at my video on there, just streamed locally. If I'm remote, then we'll just proxy it via the Meraki cloud, but it's bounced it off the outside of the cloud. One thing about Meraki, which I didn't talk about earlier, is that we never store customer data in our cloud. We try as hard as we can never to do that um, because of compliance reasons. So, um, so we, when we proxy that, we just bounce it off the edge of our cloud. This, this, when you try and click to the web browser to access that camera, it goes, oh yeah, and the camera builds a tunnel to here, you build a tunnel there, we just patch it through. You can watch that video on premise without having, even through firewalls and that kind of stuff, we try to get around everything inside there using a web browser. When you're, when you're not using the, um, when you're not viewing the video, it, it's probably worst case 50 kilobits per second per camera in there because we create a lot of metadata about that imagery. So while we're recording that video locally for the SSD, we're using the local grunt to um, create metadata about that imagery because we don't want you to watch the video all the time. We just want to create nice data for you so that you can go, oh, this happened at that site and you never have to go and look at the video or if you do, it's the last thing you do. And even if it is what you want to do, we make it even easy to do that. So that's, that's the approach inside there and, and, and manage on that. So the latest, um, that's just a, um, a slide there for you to, I'll, I'll probably publish some of these anyway. But you know, basically we're placing all that capability inside there, including the, the current generation cameras are all wireless for backhaul as well, to make that easy. Still got to power the camera. We haven't got wireless power quite sorted out yet. We're working on that one. 
Um, you know, so the Meraki, the MV product philosophy inside here, so um, from the product manager is, it's all about solving problems and not building features. I'm not gonna go and add this capability to my camera. Um, I'm gonna go and ask the person, so what, what's that capability solve? How does it make your business better so that I can solve your business problem rather than just building this new capability onto the, onto the camera? Which is unique inside Meraki for a lot of that kind of side of it. They've come a long way. The current generation cameras are these little fellas here. So every single one of these cameras have a multi-core CPU and a GPU inside. There's a fair bit of grunt inside of these cameras. Um, they all record at 1080p. They all have like 2K imagery or 4 or 8, depending on the camera model of the actual sensor inside there. They're all wireless capable, all audio capable, illegal to turn on Australia, but they, it's in there. And um, have up to 256 gig of storage. And we have indoor and outdoors. So MV22 and the 72 is the same camera, very focal camera. 72 is outdoor, so uh, IP67, IK10 plus rated. IK10, IP67 is about the water ingress protection. IK is about the vandal resistance. So IK10 is the highest, these are IK10 plus. So that's the ability to get a baseball bat and smash the crap out of the camera and not break. Um, or be or finger ingress to steal it, um, that kind of stuff. The MV12 is a little low cost, a lower cost, um, smaller camera that's, that's fixed focal length. So if you wanted to monitor this room, I could put an MV22 in this corner and monitor the whole room. Um, or I could put an MV12 with a wide angle lens built into it to monitor that room. I could probably use a narrow actually there because you probably don't want that. But anyway, that's getting too technical inside there. Um, the features and functionality on this platform come rapidly. So Meraki has a whole development process called minimal viable product and then they develop the features after that. So when they release something, it does basic functionality on day one and then over time that gets better and better. So the camera is a really good example of that. From day one, they recorded video to the local disc and allowed you to view it and that was it. Then day two, we allowed to things like motion-based searching, motion-based retention and how we store the video on, on the disc. So we keep the video on the local disc for all video for three days. And then after three days, we get all rid of all the video data where there is no movement on there because you don't need it. As opposed to what you see out there in the rest of the world where everyone does motion-based recording. I'm only gonna record, I'm gonna have a buffer of three seconds. The camera's triggered a motion, I'm gonna grab that three seconds in the buffer and store the next you know, 10 seconds and I'm gonna send that out to disk. Our cameras store everything for three days and then get rid of it when there's no movement. So there was kind of movement that didn't trigger it, it's still gonna be on the camera. So features and functionality just keep coming inside those. I won't go into too much details. I won't talk about that guy. So motion search 1.0 was the first capability we did, which I'll show you in a second. So it's the ability to look at a video image, say, just show me where there was motion in that mo moment. We just do a look up to the cloud, grab that metadata, do a quick search, and then show you that video and that video only inside there. We've enhanced that with motion search 2 recently, which is about grabbing more data and having a better look at that, rather than pixelize that data, because this is what the industry is copying now. A lot of our competitors are copying that capability. Um, is, is to have a different capability. So let's use some of the AI, let's use some of the grunt in that camera. It's got multiple processes in there. Let's start to use it and the GPU. Let's start to use that to, to you know, be better to you know, find searching capabilities. So this is sort of an imagery, oh, it's pretty crap, isn't it? Um, of, of how motion search one work where every single little pixel on there says, oh, this is where I saw movement. But motion search two, it's more about having that composite assembly. Why do I need to watch a video of someone walking in, stealing a laptop and coming out where I can just get one frame showing all that movement at that time. And that's where we're moving to inside there. So the whole idea is to never watch, watch video. So motion recap is that capability here where, you know, what, show me the movement in the camera in that time of, of that object being that person and do that. We also do a thing called object-based detection on the cameras to allow us to, you know, do a learning. That. So object-based detection, we detect objects that are humans and do capability from there. Um, API is pretty key for the camera. Back to that not storing any um, customer data in the cloud. If we serialize the face of someone on that camera, then we can't sell it into this country or very many countries in the world. So the plan is to give enough data at our API, including still imagery, to push off to platforms to do that. So um, historically, wireless has been used for tracking users um, and Bluetooth um, to, to know what's going on. That, that's being closed up, those doors are being closed. Um, with the um, Mac randomization on, on devices like these. The best, video, the best sensor you can have in the world is gonna be a video sensor because it sees everything. So if I can detect objects that are humans and do capability from that, I can then use the API to push that data off to other platforms, those existing platforms that would be doing wireless analytics, especially for retail markets and those. So we have this rich set of APIs inside the, um, there that can be used with third-party products or you can develop your own. They're all published and can all do that. And there's, there's activities on our 
um, external developer community for people to grab code and, and think they're a coder and push that in there, or if they are real coders to actually play with it. So here's an example of one that um, another peer of mine made up. So this is his driveway. He's um, used the API from the camera. Oh, I've detected motion, and it sends it off to um, little AWS instance to do some object recognition inside there. So he's de detected an object that's a human, create an event, push a video snapshot up there, um, and then use the back-end cloud to go and go and look into stuff. So the, the cloud detected here that there's most there's 99.56% chance there's a person in that video. There's also 97.1% chance that's a car, a, ve a vehicle, and 97.1% chance it's a van. Um, you know, that kind of stuff. To, to, to never look at the video, I'm going to start to pull that data out. There's no facial data observed there because he's facing away. If there was, then we could work out whether he's happy or sad or angry. Um, and then some LPR off there, so um, well, it's really you know, OCR, op, op, character recognition. So here it's detected two words on there, FedEx and, and Express. Here's another example where it does see a face. So this guy here, pretty much the same. So if it's, it's seen you know, the person, it's gone, it's most likely a male, it's a female, it's not very accurate. Um, age 50, 35 to 52. You can see from it though, like this is, this is what the camera's getting in, in that point of view. And it's, working it out from that, you know, so the better the position of the camera, the better the data, the better, you know, that would be. Um, emotional state, calm, um, if it was someone who was angry, that's what you want to know. So therefore, you can start to use this intelligence in the, in the platform, the data with the API to push data out to another platform to go, hey, there's someone that's entered my site and they're angry, let's go and raise another 90% or 70% chance they're angry, let's go and just get the security guard to go and check them out. That kind of is the future and where we're going with that capability. And uh, here it's done the LPR for the person um, for looking at the license plate um, yeah, and the facial thing has come. That's, that's it. So that's, that's using that data. This isn't, our platform doesn't do this bit. It has all the APIs and capability to push this data out. Um, we're doing some work with a few companies around that. That's the license plate that it's done LPR on. So um, we saw the three cameras before. They were all fixed field of view. The biggest question we always get asked is pan, tilt, zoom, PTZ. I've always told my customers up to about six months ago, we're never going to do one. You don't need them. A lot of rubbish. Um, so why do why organisations need PTZ? To reduce camera count, to zoom into things, to have better capability inside there. You look at around the city, there's heaps of pan, tilt, zoom cameras. The problem with pan, tilt, zoom cameras is that they only record where they're pointed. So there was an incident you know, in a local council where someone was looking at um, an object that they liked better. And, a, and a, a, an incident happened over here. That camera was looking over here. The incident was missed on the camera, which is why it's important to do field of view cameras. Um, that was in, in the paper and all that kind of stuff um, about you know, the problem and that guy doesn't have a job. Um, they're less reliable and more prone to failure. Anything that's mechanical, um, having you know, grown up, uh, my background's electronics and I used to repair video recorders and that kind of stuff way, way back when video recorders were new. Um, the biggest issue with those is mechanical. That's the bit that wore out. It's the same with these things. It's got motors in there, it's got gears. That's the bit that gums up and wears out. Most of the time in my job, I used to just spray stuff with CRC. That was it fixed, 110 bucks done. Um, <laughs> they're large, clunky, and they're expensive. Um, so the focus is not for us to build a PTZ camera. It's to, to focus on the, the, the look at the problems, uh, you know, not build a feature, not build a PTZ camera in that way. So what if we could capture everything, eliminate all those moving parts inside there, and make our smallest camera yet? That's this little fella here. So this guy here is the MV32, it's a fisheye camera. Um, fisheye cameras are great, uh, except for they have that horrible rounded view and they're, they're useless to use. It's got an 8.5 megapixel sensor in there and it can record at 2K inside there, which is massive. Um, we do in-browser de-warp with live historical um, pan, tilt, zoom and it's VR enabled. So you can put your VR headset on with one of these in and VR around the room. It's um, a bit of a novelty more than anything. It records everything, no moving parts, as I said, and virtual PTZ, I'll show you that. So when we export video off these, the, the issue is, you know, if you export video off any other fisheye out there, you get this nice rounded view, that guy there, which is pretty pointless. Um, we can export off as a flat view as well. So that means that this camera could potentially, in this room, if I wanted to cover, say this room was always open, these both these rooms, I'd have to have multiple cameras to do that. Now I can replace that with a single camera now, replacing two or three, maybe even four cameras inside there, and create you know, four flat images off that. That, that is the MV32, don't drop it, it's my real one. So that's pretty much from me. Hopefully um, you learned something about SD-WAN, you saw something about the future of what we're doing inside Meraki around video surveillance and smart cameras um, inside there. So the next steps inside here obviously is talk to Data3 about any of, you know, 
what you want to talk about. They can involve myself and, and anyone, Meraki Specials or anyone from Cisco in that case. Other options here is um, things like the evals, which is probably best to work with us again on that if you want to trial kits. And Meraki has a really good trial process to prove our technology works. Um, is that we send out stuff for a period of time. You can play with it. If you love it, you can buy it. If you hate it, you can send it back. Um, heaps of information on our blogs and our website and community sites. So go to there um, and contact the rep there. There's also heaps of webinars up there as well where you can learn a bit about technology and the capability as well. Um, probably not quite as in-depth as what I've gone today. So